Hi, my name is Thomas Kalinchik. I'm uh, from the Clinical Outcomes Research Unit, also known as CORE, at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And today I'd like to tell you about a story which recently got released by the JMA Neurology, which is a prestigious neurology journal, uh, in which Jordana Hughes, at the time a medical student, has examined how people with primary progressive MS fare over time. So the question that Jordana has asked in her work was whether relapses that are superseded on top of primary progressive course have any influence on how quickly people accrue disability during their life with primary progressive MS. And our hypothesis was that people with relapses on top of primary progressive MS will be accruing disability faster. However, what we observed was quite surprising. Jordana has used MS Base, which is a large international data set from people with multiple sclerosis from multiple countries to identify patients with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And she found 866 people with primary progressive MS without relapses and 553 patients with primary progressive MS who had also relapses in addition to their primary progressive disease course. Now, let's imagine that we plot the outcomes in these, curve, in these two cohorts in a graph. When on the x-axis we have time, which is years from disease onset. On the y-axis we have the average number of disability progression events, which means how many times a patient on average has worsened in their disability from their disease onset. So if you plot these two groups of people, those with and without relapses, on top of their primary progressive MS separately, what we observe is typically a rate of disability progressions. So this, for example, tells me that a patient in this particular group at, uh, the, at 10 years from their disease onset has the probability of, of experiencing four disability progression events. When we split this cohort into two groups, we have people with primary progressive MS with relapses and primary progressive MS without relapses. What to our surprise we observe is that the people who have primary progressive MS without relapses progress with their disability faster than those with relapses. This is an intriguing observation. So in a search for explanation of this difference, we have looked at how much therapy has to do with this. There is a surprisingly high proportion of patients with primary progressive MS around the world, but at a certain stage of their disease are exposed to immunotherapies, those therapies that are used in relapse and remitting MS, up to 50%. So we have accounted for the proportion of time that these patients with primary progressive MS spent on therapy. And what we have observed that on average, for every 10% of their follow-up time that they spent on treatment, the probability of progressing has decreased by 4%. So if someone was on treatment for the full duration of their observed and recorded follow-up, the probability of disability progression would have decreased by 40%. Now this doesn't apply to every patient with primary progressive MS. When we stratified this analysis into two sub-cohorts, one cohort of people with relapses and one cohort of people without relapses on top of their primary progressive MS, we noticed that in those without relapses, treatment made no difference to the rate of disability progression. People who were experiencing relapses, however, benefited from being on treatment. And staying on therapy has decreased the rate of the disability progression, as I have previously described. Why this observation is important? It gives the neurologist an instrument, a predictive marker. So when a neurologist observes an evidence of episodic inflammatory activity, such as a relapse, in someone who is diagnosed with primary progressive MS, 
it tells them that there is probably a reason, a justification, to treat these people with immunotherapies. However, at the present time, immunotherapies are not approved and funded for use in primary progressive MS in Australia. We are hoping that this new evidence provides us with armamentarium that we can use in a discussion with regulators for allow allowing specific access to immunotherapies for certain subgroups of people with primary progressive multiple sclerosis.